So, praise the Lord. Can y'all hear me? Praise God, man. What a sweet time already this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. So good to see you all. Good to see you all. I want to reiterate something that Bryce shared earlier about these these uh, these ministry cards. Let's just be honest. You ready? For any, I'm going to just use a, um, a term everybody understands, organization. For any organization, uh, entity, enterprise, but especially the church to operate and function, it takes a team of people, right? And it can't happen without a team of people. Praise the Lord. I want to, I want to encourage you. And maybe you've never volunteered or helped in any capacity here at Harbor Church. I want, I want you, I want to challenge you to prayerfully consider signing up to volunteer in some area once every six weeks. Once every six weeks. And you can pick an area. And listen, we've got need for greeters and hospitality, which includes parking, Harbor Kids, uh, audio, visual. We, we are, uh, you know, like we're in the playoffs, right? And I love it when these teams have stories. When one person goes down, there's someone that steps in and, and, and takes over, right? Well, we're oftentimes we're very thin in our layers and we don't have a lot of extra. Like we only have one set of guys running the sound and the slides. We only have two guys that run these cameras, right? And if any of them are out, we, we have no, we have nobody, we have no backup, right? In a beautiful world, Everybody would be on a rotation. We'd have a team of several people and people would just rotate, right? I just want to ask you to prayerfully consider, you know, just saying, Lord, yeah, I'll help. I'll help. And you get a card, you fill it out, and you say, yes, I can commit to once every six weeks. And honestly, if enough people sign up, it might be once every seven weeks, right? Uh, but, but prayerfully consider that. And here's the deal. There's a blessing in it. And, and try it. Try it. We're not going to ask for your for firstborn and make you sign a lifetime commitment, right? But, you know, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? And uh, there's something about, you know, we thank God for spectators. But, but listen, participators, that's even better. Everything has three phases. This is so amazing. You ready? The outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. Outer court Christians are those that come on Sunday. They don't really do much more, but they, and I thank God for them. Now, here's what the court represents. The court represents the kingdom. If you're into court, praise God, you're on your way to heaven. Praise the Lord. So we want folks in the court, right? The outer court, but then the inner court. Those are the saying, listen, I want to go to the next level. I want to go to not the next level in terms of how much God loves you, but just I want to be more involved, right? That's that inner court. And then there's the holy of holies. Those are, those are prayer warriors. Those are people that just really take an ownership in the kingdom of God, and they know they're called to do something very specific God has called them to do. God wants to move you. There's a progression in the Christian life. We should go from glory to glory to glory and from faith to faith to faith. And if you feel stuck, get unstuck by getting involved. Praise God and watch the Lord bless you and you'll see him show up. You cannot serve the Lord without his blessing following. And, and here's what we're big on. And we don't talk about serving the Lord a lot, right? We don't use that phrase because it's been talked about a lot. Uh, if, if you have a choice between sonship and servanthood, get your sonship on. I'd rather you know about who you are in Christ any day than you serving. There's a lot of people that serve in church that they don't know who they are in Christ and they get their identity in their servanthood. You, you can't do that, right? But when you know who you are in Christ, you're a son or daughter of the Most High God, and then you serve, it makes the headlines. It makes the headlines of heaven. When Prince Charles and Andrew served, when their mother would go to some area and tour and talk about landmines and she'd feed children, it was headline news. Why? Because she's royalty. Now, she's serving, and she doesn't come off that way. Her sons don't necessarily come off that way. Maybe if you listen to them in an interview, but they've been, they've learned that, hey, you're supposed to serve. They both served in the military in their country, right? And that makes headlines, right? So serve from your sonship, from your daughterhood, but please serve. Amen. God wants you to serve. And when you do, listen, heaven takes note. When God's kingdom is important to us, listen, then our world is important to him. It's just the way it is, right? There is never, uh, in the gospel, in the gospel of grace, there is no lack of reciprocation. 
You cannot do something as unto the Lord without Him doing it back unto you. And, it, and when He does it, it's in a greater way. It's in a greater way. It's in a greater uh, measure. It's in a greater quality. It's always greater. Amen. So I want to encourage you. Would you prayerfully consider saying, hey, I'll sign up to do something once every six weeks, right? And we may only put you on the list for once every seven. Because again, if everybody does it, praise God. And then what a joy it is. I mean, you're, what a blessing. Amen. So enough said. Please grab one of these before you leave, before you leave today. All right. Can we say amen? Y'all was all quiet right there. Amen. Come on. Mm-hmm. I love what Joyce Meyer says. Sometimes it's an ouch and then a hallelujah. Amen. Ouch. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? Praise God. All right. Hey, greater works part five. You know, and when I was looking at this, I was like, oh, yeah, there are five Sundays in the month of January. Amen. The fifth Sunday is always special. Like, that's just the grace. I love five. Five is the number of grace. And so a fifth Sunday is just extra special, praise God. And so part five of our series, kicking off the brand new year here, greater, greater works, greater works. Now, I want to start before I get into the message with a foundation for where we're going. And really, it's the foundation for this whole series, okay? And that is this. And this is the gospel. This is what sets the gospel apart from the law. You ready? See, the law says you have to and you must. Grace says you get to, and it's a privilege. Amen? And here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the concept of indicative before imperative. What do I mean by that? Indicative, indicative, indicative before imperative. Now, what's an imperative? An imperative is a command. Uh, uh, an imperative is instruction. Uh, a, an imperative is a challenge in an area, right? But in the gospel, and particularly in the God, and this is what sets the gospel apart, there's no command or imperative without the indicative first. Now, what I mean by that is called the therefore. When you see a scripture, particularly in the New Testament, and you see a therefore in the scripture, then you need to stop for just a second and find out why the therefore is therefore. And when you find out why the therefore is therefore, then it helps you understand what you're about to read. And the therefore simply means, hey, because of what you just read, because of the foundation of what you just absorbed, let me charge you in this area. Let me instruct you in this area. Again, uh, indicative before imperative. A, a beautiful example of this is Romans 12, 1. I've got it up here in the, uh, the NIV. It says this. Throw that up for me, if you will. Here we go. It says, therefore, starts out with a therefore, right? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. Now, that word urge uh, in the original language, and that is almost not doing it a justice right there. But Paul is saying this in the strongest possible way way he's saying this to to believers, the church at Rome. He says, therefore, I urge you in the strongest possible way, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then he goes on. This is uh, an, an imperative. You ready? Hey, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I love the Amplified. It says God's perfect plan even for your life. So the therefore is speaking of what was just spoken. And what was just spoken is God is uh, uh, Paul is, is is laying out the kingdom. He's talking about our place in the kingdom, who we are in Christ, uh, what God has done on our behalf. And then he says, therefore, in light of this fact, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So there's the indicative, and then there's the imperative. Here's another one for you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Now, you don't see the word therefore. But therefore here is it's assumed. I mean, you can read it right here, right? If you read, if you just if you grasp it, he says this. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are uh, uh do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you received from God? So that's an indicator. The indicator says, Hey, you need to know that your body ain't just your body, your body is 
is the temple of the living God. And we should say, whoa, wow, Christ in you, the hope of glory, amen? And now here comes the imperative. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Here you go. Here's your therefore. You ready? Therefore, honor God with your bodies, right? So here's what he's saying. I want you to understand who you are. And once you understand it, see, that's why it's important. You don't just serve because you're just trying to get in God's good graces. Stop that. Sit down. We don't even want you to do it. We'll be shorthanded before we let you do that. But serve knowing who you are in Christ. Amen? Come on. You ain't serving so that brother so-and-so pats you in the back or you get this person talking about how good you did this this Sunday or whatever. We're not serving. I don't need that. Why? Because I already know who I am in Christ. You see? And, and listen, can we be honest? There's a lot of that crazy stuff that goes on in the church world. People do all kinds of stuff for all kinds of reasons. Good stuff, mind you. You ever heard that saying? You can be, you can, listen, you can be right and still be wrong. You can do a lot of good stuff. But it, and, and, and please understand, now, here's the test for the believer. We're not going to face the judgment of the world. The judgment seat that we will face is called the Bema seat as the believers in Jesus Christ. All your sins have been washed away. Don't let nobody tell you there's a big movie screen in heaven that's going to play your, play your every sin that you've ever committed. I don't know who came up with that, okay? That is, that is nowhere in Scripture. But here's what's going to happen. Our judgment is called the Bema Seat of Christ. That's the original name. Study this if you don't believe me. Look it up for yourself. And what is the Bema Seat? The Bema, it comes from the origin of, of uh, the Olympics. And the Olympics was started in Greece. And the New Testament is written in Greek, right? And on the Bema, you got, you got the gold medalist, you got the silver medalist, and then you got the bronze medalist. And they're bending over and they're getting that medal put up around their neck. And if you're the gold medalist, your flag comes down and they sing your nat national anthem, right? That, that's, that stand is called the bema. That's what that's called. It's called the bema. When you and I stand before the Lord, listen, we are going to stand before the Lord at the bema seat of Christ. Now, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit's fire blows through and it tests all of our works and only those things that are pure and really of God, that is what passes the test of fire. And that's what you're going to get rewarded for. See, if you were given so that someone could see your gift, ain't going to do you no good. If you've got to tell somebody when you give something to somebody, you need to check that because you're doing it and you've already got your reward. You ain't getting nothing in heaven for that because you already told somebody what you're doing. Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing or vice versa, right? You give in secret, and then we're rewarded in open. See, God can't keep a secret. What we do in secret, God rewards openly. He wants you to keep the secret, but let him reward you openly. So you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna face the beam of seat. And when you're giving and serving and living under the concept of who you are in Christ, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm not trying to get anybody's favor because I'm already impressed. I'm already impressed. God's already impressed with me. So, so that he sent his only son to the cross to die for me. What, what more can I ask for? Like you can't sit down when you're already seated. You are already seated with Christ in heavenly places. There's nowhere for you to go from where you are at the moment in terms of you being in God's good graces. That's an old religious saying. Well, I just need to make sure I get in God's good graces. So here's the deal. You don't come to church to get in God's good graces. You come to church because you need to be built up in your most holy faith. You don't read your Bible so you can put the star on your refrigerator. You read your Bible so because your spirit man has to have spiritual food, and that's found in God's Word. You don't pray uh, because Sister So-and-so she says she prays for an hour every day, so I need to pray for an hour and ten minutes because I don't even like her, and i got to do it more than she does. You don't want to do that. You want to pray because you love your heavenly father. Oh, my goodness, you love him and the Holy Spirit. And he's, oh, he's so real in your life. And you want to talk to him because he's your best friend. You see the difference? And that's the, that's, and that's the difference. And this is indicative and then imperative. And, and, and the New Testament is that way. Let me give you another one. Here's Colossians 3. Uh, I'm like, this is a long one, but you ready for this one? 
Here's your indicative before the imperative. See, there's a lot of Christians that don't even know who they are. How can you say that? Because there's a lot of Christians that don't act right. There's a lot of Christians that live in sin and open sin. And you know what their problem is? I can say, they got a sin problem. No, they don't. They got an identity crisis. You don't know who you are. Because if you knew who you were, you couldn't do what you're doing and feel good about it. You just can't do it. That's a whole lesson. The Bible, the Paul says, the Spirit of God constraineth me. It's the Spirit of God that keeps me out of trouble. Amen? Not because I'm trying hard. I tried hard and messed up, still messed up. But it's when I got a revelation of who I was in Christ. That's the game changer. I didn't mean to go this long on this one right here. You ready? But we're just going to go there, all right? Let me read this, Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Somebody needs to hear this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Listen to this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Here's the indicator. You've been raised with Christ. You're a new creation. So since indicative, you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. That's indicative. That's, that's what really happened to you. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. That's indicative. Here's imperative. You ready? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality. Come on, sexual immorality. Fornication. What's fornication? It's sexual relations outside of marriage. I don't care who you are. It's a sin, right? I mean, it just, I'm just being honest with you, okay? It, it, it says it right here. I know that's not in fashion, and I know that's not vogue, but I don't care. People need to hear this. And listen, Christians need to hear this. I know it's, come on. Y'all acting very Presbyterian in here. All quiet. Listen, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now listen, lust, evil desires, greed. Sometimes you can't help the thoughts that come to your head. Thoughts are like birds. You can't help them from flying over your head, but you don't have to let them build a nest in your hair. Amen? You can cast thoughts. You can take thoughts captive in Jesus' name. Amen? Now here's an indicative. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self and its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Now, you see how that works? Don't just give somebody a command to live right. You first need to make sure they know who they are. Amen? Why? Because I'm focusing on the root. And if I focus on the root, come. The fruit's going to come. Amen? An apple tree is not straining to produce the apples. If that apple tree is fertile in fertile soil, got the water it needs, it is going to flourish and produce the fruit that it produces. Amen? And, it, and it's not an issue and it's not a problem. Amen? So, listen to this. I love this. You don't do to become but you do because you are. Amen? If you said, I'm going to master every one of those, and you did it, but you did it out of effort and trying hard and discipline, okay, great. Now what? Well, that makes me more pleasing to God. That makes God like me more. You're all wrong, you see. You don't do to be. You do because you already are. Amen? And see, here's what's so important. If you find yourself struggling in any area of life, dive deep into the gospel of grace. Dive deep in understanding who you are in Christ. And then what happens is there's a transformation that then takes place. God transforms you and changes you from the inside out. Too many times in the church, we're fruit inspectors. Well, I see that fruit and I see that fruit. Sit down, just sit down. And quit looking at everybody's fruit. Look at your own fruit. Amen? Sit down. Because here's the deal. If the root's good, the fruit will be good in Jesus' name. Amen? So indicative. 
before imperative. Praise the Lord. Now I got to roll through this right here, all right? We got 15 minutes to do it, something like that. We're going to try anyway, amen? I want to share this amazing story with you. And see, listen, this is what Greater Works is all about. We're not working because we're in the works, and we're not working in 2023 to get God to like us more. We're working because we've been changed and transformed. And so our life, I'm going to read the verse to you in a minute, should produce a different kind of work. And so it is the year of greater works. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Like you got to work this thing out. And when you work it out and you say, Lord, yes, I'm really a son and you love me anyway on my worst day, my best day, your love for me is the same. I cannot fail. If you are for me, who can be against me? And from that knowledge, you learn how to start resting in Christ. And then he changes you from the inside out. Amen. That's how it works. Amen. Come on. I want to read this to you. It's an amazing, beautiful story. Oh, I love this story. It's Acts chapter 10. I'm just going to read the whole chapter. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bunch of verses, but we're just going to roll right through it, okay? I can tell you about it, but I'd rather read it. Then you just don't have to worry about did I make that up because I just read it to you out of God's Word. Amen? Here we go. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says this. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman officer named Cornelius who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man who, uh, a, a, a doubt, a devout, he was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius! The angel said, Cornelius start, uh, stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now, send someone to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner. Tanner means this guy's profession was he tanned Hides, you know, sheep hide, cow hide, he made leather, whatever. He was a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, and he told them what had happened and he sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius's, Cornelius's messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat of the roof. The roofs in the Middle East, even still today, they're flat. There's terraces up there. You can walk around. It was about noon, and he was hungry. So about noon, Peter's hungry. There's an indication here that he was probably fasting because he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, this word trance, and you're going to see the word vision in a moment, can be described as an open vision. He wasn't asleep. He wasn't dreaming. He was awake, broad daylight, and he just saw this open vision right in front of him. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals and reptiles and birds. And then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. Now, what's that mean? Those, those animals in the sheep, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't kosher. It wasn't stuff allowed under Levitical law for Peter to consume. There was a strict diet that the, that the law gave to the children of Israel. And Peter's like, I've never eaten anything that's not on the do-eat list. Anything on the do-not-eat list, I don't touch it, right? And I'm really glad this happened for him because we get to eat bacon now because he, he wouldn't eat pork. We get to have a ham at Easter, right? Oysters, shrimp, I mean, you name it. There's a lot of stuff they couldn't eat, right? And now the Lord's saying, hey, in this vision, hey, I want you to kill it and I want you to eat it. But then the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheep was suddenly pulled away. Listen, two times is a confirmation. Three times, God is emphatic with it. 
If the Lord ever is speaking to you about something, listen, he says, wait, it'll be confirmed by two or three witnesses. My word is confirmed by two or three witnesses. If God's leading you in a direction and you're praying about it and you're seeking the Lord, you seek God and he's going to be faithful to confirm. You'll get one, you'll get, you'll get one, a confirmation. So confirmation will be two, or you may get multiple com confirmations. In this case, he got three. He saw this thing three times and it was an absolute imperative that God was saying this to him. He, in other words, he walked away from there with no doubt what God had just spoken to him. No doubt. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. How did the Holy Spirit say this to him, by the way? I don't believe it was a loud, audible voice that came down from heaven. I believe that Peter heard the voice of the Holy Spirit the same way you and I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. It is the inward witness. God can speak to us and does speak to us, and he leads us, right? So he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I am the man that you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, hey, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout, God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. The holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night, and the next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. So Peter took some guys with him. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. Then Peter, but Peter, pulled him up and said, Stand up, I'm a hu human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Cornelius didn't, he, he, he didn't understand this. He don't know who, he's thinking this might be a god, right? And Peter says, no, I'm just like you. And so he welcomes Peter into his home. Here's what Peter says in verse 28. This is important. Peter told them, you know that it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. Now, what does he mean Gentile? Jews were only, uh, uh, were only supposed to habitate, connect with other Jews. They were not supposed to have close connections with any Gentile. What's a Gentile? A Gentile is considered anybody that's a non-Jew. You and I, if you're not Jewish or of Jewish descent here today, you are a Gentile. So the Jewish people is a very small race, by the way. You understand the rest of the world is full of Gentiles. But in the Jewish race, in the Old Testament law, they were not to have connections with non-Jews. This is why it was a really big deal when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman by the well who was a Gentile, by the way. Isn't that interesting? So he said, hey, I'm not even supposed to be in your house, right? Peter told him, you know, it's against the law for Jews to enter the house uh, of Gentiles and to associate with you, but God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Paul clarifies this later in a letter to the church. He says, don't call someone slave we're not known by slave or free or woman or man by race. We're known as the children of God. Amen? But this is where it started. This is where it started. He says, God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure as unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent, uh, as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent me. So Peter said, hey, tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied. And then he tells him about the whole vision that he got from the angel. He tells them all about it, right? And then skip down to 34. Uh, Peter says this. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of the good news of the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, or Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching uh, uh, his message of baptism. And you know what God, you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then Jesus went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Peter is preaching the gospel about Jesus Christ in Cornelius' home. 
And then he goes on to say, and we apostles, I'm one of the apostles. We were witnesses of all this, all that he did throughout Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. And when God, see, this could have been Billy Graham preaching to a thousand people in a crusade. Paul is preaching, I mean, Peter is preaching the gospel and the story of Jesus in Cornelius' house with a house full of people. He says, uh, 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 where, where was I? Where was I? What verse was I at? Somebody help me. I'm at 41. Thank you, sir. 41, 41. Where are you, 41? Let's see. Yep, 42. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one. He is the one. All the prophets testified about saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven even through his name. Even as Peter was saying these things, so as he's preaching the gospel, here's what happens. You ready? The Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. He didn't have to give an invitation. He didn't have to say the end. He didn't say, I got one more point, then we're going to go. He didn't say none of that. While he's preaching, the Holy Spirit fills the place, falls upon all of them who are listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they had heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. That's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. And now they're seeing another Pentecost day happen in the home of Gentiles. And then Peter asks, can anyone object? He's asking the guys with him, hey, can anyone object? So they're being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just like we did. So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Wow, what a powerful, incredible, mighty story. And not only is it a mighty story, it's a historic story. Because here's the deal. This is the first account of the gospel being preached to someone that's not a Jew. You know, Jesus did not go around preaching the good news of heaven outside of the Jewish community. There was a woman that came up to him one day, a Gentile, said, hey, my daughter is sick. Uh, she needs healing. And, and Jesus says, hey, can the, uh, uh, can the dogs, uh, uh, can, can, can the master give meat to the dogs at the table? And she said, yeah, but even the dogs get the crumbs. And he said, well, I can't resist this girl. You go home, your, your child's going to be healed. And, and the child was healed. He had some slight encounters with Gentiles, but first he had to bring the good news to the Jews to be rejected by the Jews so that the good news could come to you and me. And I'm so glad for that. Listen, their loss was our gain, amen? And God opened this thing up, and you and I have become benefactors of the gospel and the good news. But if you trace the origin of that all the way back, it started right here for the very first time on that seashore. And it was beautiful, right there in Caesarea Philippi. I've been there. It's amazing. It's a beautiful beautiful. I've been to Joppa, and I saw that once. I just one time I've been to Israel, and I'm like, whoa, and all I could think about was this, and I'm connecting the dots, and I'm like, oh, how historic this is. Had this not happened, we wouldn't be here today. Check that, man. Check that, and stuff that all the way back, and the gospel being given to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, all happened right here. Is that not amazing? Not amazing. Praise God. Now, what's that got to do with greater works? We're going to get there in a moment. You ready? We're going to get there in just a moment. A couple of Sunday goes, uh, Sundays ago, I brought in these three arrows, and I talked about the arrows that we see in God's Word, the arrows praying, fasting, and giving. Now, here's why we're talking about this at the beginning of the year. You know why we're talking about this at the, at the beginning of the year? Let me tell you why. Because God wants this to be the best year you've ever known. How do you know that? Well, do you want it to be the best year your kids have ever known? Well, how much more does your Father in heaven want to give good gifts to those that ask Him? He loves you so much. He don't want you to get through 2023 without being able to look back and say, but God, all year long. And here's the beauty. To have that kind of year, listen, 
indicator. I just gave you the indicator. You ready? This is because he loves you so much. Amen. He wants to pour some new wine into your wineskins. The wineskins represents our flesh, ourselves, us. But he wants to do a new thing. Behold, I do a new thing. Shall you not know it? He wants to pour the new wine. Don't you want a new touch from heaven? Don't you want to see God do some new things in your life, amen, that you've never seen before? No doubt, many of you have got, you've got thoughts and prayers and dreams and visions of things that you want to see happen in your life, amen? Listen, this may be that very year. There's things you're praying about that you don't know how it's going to happen. God does, and he knows how to connect the dots. He knows your email address. He knows your text phone number. He knows, he knows your address, your P.O. box. He knows everything about you, and he knows how to connect the dots. Amen? And this is why it's important. As we start the year, he is saying to us, listen, and, and I'm, we're not the only ones preaching this. It's not like all the pastors around the world or many have got together to this. Let's come up with this plan. But I'm hearing the Spirit of God saying this throughout churches because God is calling his people to greater works. And our job, listen, is to work with the Holy Spirit to provide the new wine skins so that he can pour his new wine in. Indicative, then imperative. Amen? So greater works. Listen, I'm telling you, if we get this foundation of praying, fasting, and giving, fa why do I want to fast? It's for breakthrough. There's all kinds of reasons to fast. But I'm telling you right now, when you learn how to push away from something related to the world, uh, something that's, that, that connects to you, what you think, what you like, what you feel, what you want, and you say, I'm pushing that aside, Lord, because I need to hear from you. I'm pushing this aside because I need you to show up in this area. Amen. And see, here's the deal. Uh, we are so bombarded with the things of this world. Sometimes you just have to take a break. You have to pull yourself away from the things of the world and take a little, take a pause so you can hear from God. And fasting could be a meal. It could be a 12-hour period. Intermittent fasting may say, hey, I'm going to go from this time to this time. And Father, I'm going to take what, the time that I would be eating. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to be problem. I need this. I need this to show up in my life. Not fasting to get God to do it. Why? Because he already wants to do it. But you're fasting for the breakthrough. There's, a, there's an unseen realm of warfare going on around you. And there's a part that you play in it. Yes, we love the verse that says God wants to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask, think, hope, and imagine. And then we like to stop right there, but here's the next part. According to the power that worketh in you. You got some skin in this. You got something to add to the equation. God works natural by putting his super on natural, and that's why it's called supernatural. Amen? You want some super in your natural? You push away. You say, Lord, I'm seeking you. I'm pushing away, maybe a meal, maybe this, maybe that. Maybe you do two or three. It's like whatever God leads you to do. I can't fast on my own, but when God leads me to do it, boy, he graces me and gives me the ability to do it. And there's times when it's important to do it. I've done some already this year, and it's just been a blessing. But it's important to seek the Lord with fasting and prayer. And then I talked about that third arrow that Sunday, which was the arrow of giving. And Jesus says this in the New, in the New Testament in Matthew. He said, hey, when you, when you pray, when you fast, and when you give. And if you learn how to walk in the combination of that three, it's powerful. You've been to a baseball game or seen a baseball game on TV when they have a triple play. It's not often. It can be rare, but when it happens, the, everybody goes wild. Even the opposing team sometimes will cheer at it because it's like, whoa, we don't see that very often, right? You throw a triple play in the mix, and it's like, whoa, praise God. Amen? Praise God. These are all important. But this morning, I want to talk to you about this. Before we close, you ready? I want to talk to you about the old one-two punch. You ready for this? The old one-two punch. Now, my dad used to watch boxing. He loved boxing when I was a kid, so we'd watch boxing. Back then, Muhammad Ali, when I was a kid, was still fighting. and Boy, they called him the Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. He had this thing he called the rope-a-dope. He'd get them on the ropes, and he'd just do the rope-a-dope on them, right? And, and, and boy, I mean, there was, a, there, was a, there was a punch that he could land on somebody, and boom, it was over. And then later, Mike Tyson was that guy, right? I remember being in the Marine Corps, and we were in the barracks, and we were watching a Mike Tyson fight. And there was some of these guys that 
whole thing up and dude lasts a half a round. He's out cold because my one hit from Mike Tyson just took the dude slam out, right? And, and of course, the sponsor's like, you got to make this last longer because we're, we're selling all these tickets. Everybody's mad because they want to see some, some fight here, right? But the one-two punch got activated and it was over, right? Well, listen, there is a one-two punch that can happen for you as a believer. It's called a combination, and you can use it often, and I highly recommend it. When you think about the old one-two, listen to this. I just looked this up. It says, it says the uh, uh, a one-two, and I, one guy I read about says, the earliest thing I can see is a mention about the old one-two punch was around 1910, and there was an article written about a, a famous boxer at the time. And so that's how it came to be. It says, a one-two punch is a boxing maneuver that consists of two powerful but quick blows to the head, a left uppercut or right hook, for example. It is used as a metaphor for finishing something off with a winning combination. Listen. There are some things God wants you to finish off. Come on. Aren't you tired of going around the same mountain over and over in your life? I have been at times. Amen. Listen, if you're frustrated about it, he's your heavenly father. He loves you so much. He's tired of seeing that happen in your life too. And so he's given us this powerful one-two punch. Uh, here's another meaning. The meaning of the one-two punch is, number one, a fast combination of punches. But I love this next one, the metaphoric. A powerful combination of two people or things. Oh, my goodness. There's nothing like the power of agreement in prayer, especially between a husband and wife. Husbands and wives, I want to encourage you to pray. Like, get your, get your wife's hand, hubs, or wife, grab your husband. And just, you may not do it every day. It'd be great if you could, but listen, function in the unction. Just grab a hand and just, baby, let's pray real quick. Amen. Something powerful about it. My wife's blow drying her hair, getting ready for this morning. I'm walking out the door to come in. I said, baby, let's pray. We prayed for this day. Some of you are here and you weren't even sure you were coming at 8 o'clock this morning when we prayed that prayer. Well, the Lord spoke to you and said, get on down there to that church. It's a blessing for you. And so you came. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. You know why? Because we did a one-two right here. I grabbed her hand and said, baby, let's pray real quick for the day. Amen? Sometimes you got to get out the one-two. Sometimes that's people or it can be two powerful things. Listen, in Cornelius' story right here, Cornelius had been using this one-two punch combination, and he'd been doing it for a long time. And you know what that was called? Prayer and giving. Prayer and giving. Prayer and giving. Prayer and and giving. We got some Christians that'll pray, but they won't ever give. They got one hand tied behind their back. Or maybe they'll give some. Now, I'd love to give. I give, but I don't ever pray. So you're just doing this. You better get this one out because you both of them. Amen. Pray, give. Pray, give. Amen. Listen, here's three quick takeaways as we close. You ready? Three things that we see about this story of praying and giving in Cornelius' life. Number one, Praying and giving bring divine intervention. Do you think it was some coincidence that an angel showed up at Cornelius' house one day? That ain't never happened to Cornelius. So much that this, he's, he's afraid. He's in fear when he sees this angel. Angel says, hey, Cornelius, your prayers and your gifts have come up to heaven as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. Now, because of that, here's what God wants you to do. And then God gives detailed instructions. I want you to send some servants to Joppa. I want you to go to a place called Straight Street and at a house of a guy named Simon who is a tanner. Simon the tanner. You're going to find a guy named Peter. And I want you to bring Peter back to this house. There's about 35 or 40 miles between these two towns. This is crazy. This is beyond coincidence. They said, God wants to do some things in your life that are beyond coincidence that you will only be able to say, God did that. There's no other way, but God did that. Amen. I got some of those stories. Listen, you got some of them. Amen. Some of you are sitting with spouses today that only God could have put that combination together. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Here's, a, here's an unlikely. You ready? Cornelius is a Roman officer. 
Like, you understand that the Romans had invaded Jerusalem and Israel, and they're the occupying force. They're the enemy. That's the enemy, right? And he goes to the enemy's house and uses the enemy of God's people to be the first one to get the good news as a Gentile. Wow. All of that takes divine intervention. Listen, and when you learn how to use that one, two, you'll see divine intervention in your life. You'll see things that only God could do show up in your life. Amen. And you got to give him praise for that. Here's the second thing I wrote down. Praying and giving that one, two. Listen, it works for anyone regardless of social status or pedigree. Again, this man's a Roman officer. This, listen, this wasn't supposed to happen. Can I tell you how many things I do in my life that I ain't supposed to be doing? I I, I could just give you a list. And I don't want you to think, oh, you're bragging. No, I'm not bragging. You don't even know how I'm not bragging. Because if it wasn't for God, there is no way under the sun I could be doing a lot of, I could be doing any of what I do. Except for the Lord. I wasn't born into some things I do. I had no prior experience in some things that I do. I get to do to this day. But it was just the Lord. And see, really, he loves doing stuff like that because then only he can get the glory. Amen? Listen, the one-two punch of prayer and giving, listen, it invades social status. It knows how to go to this side of town and that side of town and change somebody here or change somebody there. Amen? Number three, as we close, you ready for this? Cornelius' prayers and giving impacted all that were near and dear to him. When the angel of the Lord came, when the angel of the Lord came, he said, gather everybody around you. Get some folks together. And he went around calling all of his loved ones and family and servants and friends to the house because they're expecting this man of God to come and they're going to hear this great message. They don't even know how it's going to all unfold. But because Cornelius had been faithful in praying and giving, it impacted, listen, it impacted those nearest and dearest to him, his loved ones and his family members. It impacted them. I want to live as long as I can. I was telling my daughter the other day, I said, but baby, you're the next generation after me. Courtney, that's in Texas. We were talking about ministry things. and, And I said, listen, When you're my age, likely I won't be around. I may not be here, but you'll be able to carry on things that were started that hopefully you will be walking in because of that. And how can you say that? Oh, that's just boastful. No, because I'm a product. I'm a byproduct. Some of that myself. Throw that picture up for me, if you will. These are these are these are just kind of rough pictures here, but throw these pictures up for me, if you will. Over to the far right, there's a guy in what Na- appears to be a Navy suit. That was a Coast Guard. That's my mother's father. His name was Edward Mumford. And when Edward Mumford got saved, he was rough as a cob. He drove too fast. He drank too much. He loved LaRue, but he just, he was just, uh, he was rough. He was, a, he was a good guy. But then one day, some people knocked on his door from Calvary Baptist Church in Greenville, and they, they led him to Christ. And the man got saved. By this time, World War II is over. It's the late 50s. He's driving a bread truck for the Danny May Bread Company. And he's driving, and he's got five children at home, him and LaRue. One of their younger children had special needs, blind and mentally challenged. That's Uncle Put, who comes every now and then with my mother. And he heard the gospel, and this guy really, he really got saved. He got so saved that he couldn't fit the family in the car, so they got the bread truck, and that's how they went to church. They got everybody in the bread truck went to church. You knew Edward and them were there because the bread truck was at church. He's there every time the doors are open, and he learned how to pray and how to give. Now, tragically, when my mother was 12, my grandfather was on that bread truck one day, and he pulled out from a store in a little area called Speed, North Carolina, in Edgecombe County near Tarboro, and as he pulled out from the store, a train hit him, And killed him instantly. And there was a guy with him, first day on the job. He's training the guy. And both of them were killed instantly. 
I'll never forget looking at his wallet. My grandmother had the wallet that he was carrying with him one day. He had a $2 bill in there and just some pictures of his family. I was like, whoa, that's the closest I ever got to meeting Edward Jones. And I was like, whoa. And I tell people that before he was killed, though, he did two really important things. He got some life insurance. I highly advise it, by the way. He got some life. He just had this thought, I need to get some life insurance. Something were to happen to me, LaRue's got to be able to take care of these kids. And he got some life insurance. And sure enough, he was killed not long after that. And she had enough money to build a little three-bedroom, one-bath, little small, tiny brick home in, in Grifton on St. David Street. And she moved the kids to Grifton. Her sister was living there, and she raised it because she never remarried. She never had to work a job outside of the home because she sewed and baked cakes, but Edward had worked it out with some life insurance. So she, her cost of living was low. She got a social security check. She managed it. But praise God, he got life insurance. And then I tell people he got some legacy assurance too, right before he was killed. Because one day, see, he so like his bread route became his ministry. And he went into these country stores all over Eastern Carolina, just face beaming, glowing, sharing the good news every chance he got. And one day he goes to his pastor. He said, Pastor, radio is big. And, and I want our church to have a radio broadcast. I'm listening to these churches on the radio when I'm out on my bread truck. And I want our church to be on the radio. And I've gotten some money together and I just want to give it. He didn't have a lot of money. He said, but I got some money together and I want to give it to you. And this is just an offering that I want to give you because I want our church on the radio. AM radio was big. And he sowed that seed. And it wasn't long after that. I mean, just short. He was gone. And they dedicated that first broadcast for Calvary Baptist Church on the radio to Edward Mumford. Isn't that crazy? For as long as I can remember, I've had something in me about radio. I remember as a kid, I would do the weather. My friends would, hey, Johnny, do the weather. And I'd act like a radio DJ and do the weather. And I didn't know what all that was for. I, try, I worked two little part-time jobs at AM stations in high school and, and right out of high school, but never had a career out of it. But then the Lord's telling me one day, he says, he, he's speaking to me. He said, I'm going to get you in, in the radio business. I'm going to put you in a Christian radio station. Someone asked me a question. Hey, if you won the lottery, what would you do? If you just had all the money you'd want, well, what would you do with it? I said, I'd start a Christian FM radio station. That's important that you know what you do with it. Otherwise, you might build a calf, a golden calf, right? Seriously. People do that. I said, I'd have a radio station. And it wasn't long that the Lord put me in a radio station. And we've, we've celebrated 10 years. I'm not telling you that to boast or brag. It's not about that. I'm just telling you it would not have been possible. I'm the oldest of Edward Mumford's grandchildren. And for some reason, I couldn't shake radio. I have a radio heritage. My son, who looks just like that man, works in radio every day of his life. Wow. And you know what? Somebody told me, said, you know what? This uh, radio antenna is like a tent pole. And there's a tent going out throughout Eastern Carolina. And I looked at our coverage map. And the coverage map of that station is about the same as what his bread route was. As we share the good news by way of radio every single day. Is that amazing? That's just God. Amen. Listen, listen. Your gifts and your prayers, come on, make room for you and the generation after you. It ain't just about you. It's about your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids. And what about your great-great-great-great-grandkids? And then that lady on the right, Mamie Jones, see the two things that I love and have passion for in my life, radio, but ministry, came from that lady right on the right, Mamie B. Jones. And listen, if I could not preach the full gospel, I would not want to preach. The Lord knew before the foundations of the world He was going to call me one day to preach and be a pastor. But he waited until I got filled, gloriously baptized with the Holy Spirit so that I can preach the whole good news. And that's what she was. She was a full gospel believer and she sowed faithfully to full gospel ministries. One, one in fact, was Old Roberts Ministries. Back in the day when Old Roberts took his tent around the country and preached healing and that God's a good God and God really does want to bless you and he loves you. She supported him faithfully. My dad became a pastor and he's a Baptist. And, he, and we didn't like Will Roberts. And, and he went to his mom and said, Mama, don't send them your money. Why are you sending money to him? And she said, it's my money and I'll do with what I want to. 
And she sewed faithfully out of a fixed income social security check living in a, 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 a an apartment for the elderly. She sewed to the day. I have been places in ministry. God confirmed my call to ministry in the prayer tower of Oral Roberts University many years ago. What she would have done to have been there one day. But I am. And I'm Mamie B. Jones. And I'm Edward Mumford. I am the byproduct of seeds sown in faith. Listen, you got children in your loins. You got heritage in you. They need you to get off your non-given self and begin to pray and give, pray and give, pray and give. You can't take it with you when you go. And God wants to do something in and through you while you're living. Amen. Trust Him with it. And you watch Him. You have kids and grandkids that say one day, I am my grandma. I am my grandfather. I am my dad and I am my mom because they sowed faithfully and they prayed faithfully and I have a heritage that I walk in of praying and giving and giving, praying, and I'm here today because of the goodness of God. Amen? See, some of the stuff I walk in came way too easy for me, but the Lord let me know right away. He says, you do know this ain't about you and because of you. He said, somebody else sowed for this. Who are you sowing for? Who are you sowing for? Who are you praying for? Pray, give. Pray, give. I promise you, if you do, it will be the year of greater works in your life. It won't be just the year of greater works. It'll be a lifetime of greater works. And I'm walking in greater works today than only God could have done through the faithful prayers and giving of someone else. Amen? Praise the Lord. Bryce, you come if you will.